So just to let everybody know, this is being recorded and we will have the recording available to everyone and accessible and it will include closed captions. We want to keep um, accessibility mindful as we go through and switching everything to online. So we will have closed captions to our recording. We will also, when we do introductions, do a verbal description too for those that are visually impaired. So to start us off, good afternoon, good morning, depending on the time zone where you are at. I wanna first um, begin by welcoming you to our webinar on COVID-19, Fear, Stigma, and Steps Forward. This is hosted by the American Anthropological Association, the Society for Medical Anthropology, and the Special Interest Group, Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies. During this time of high stress and anxiety for everyone, we really wanna thank you for joining us today. As we've been hearing from our leaders, we all have a role to play in this and we're in this together. So it is our hope through the webinar today that we can share some information, discuss ways to contribute and offer a handle on how to proceed forward. Before we jump into our speakers, a few housekeeping tips. First, a disclaimer, this is a very fluid and ever-changing situation. So if you're watching this um, today or even future recordings as it gets spread around, please keep the date in mind because information and situations could change. For connection, if you are having trouble on Zoom, um, you could try either reconnecting if, it, if there is a glitch because we do have a large number of people on, or you can also try calling in instead of being on the Zoom video. And so the call-in information is listed here. For the Zoom menu, two functions I wanted to point out. One on the bottom menu, if you hover over the bottom of the screen, the menu bar should pop up. There's an icon that looks like a microphone and that icon allows a speaker to mute and unmute. If you could please keep yourself on mute, that allows us to get some clear audio, especially in our recording. And in addition, another icon on that bottom menu is a little message icon that if you click on that, it opens up your chat window. There's already a lot of activity going on in the chat window, which is great. This is where we would like you to post any questions in this chat window. My co-chair, Dion, is gonna be helping collect those, those questions. That way we can have all of our speakers present and then have a question and answer session. So throughout the webinar, if you have questions, go ahead and post it in the chat window. So introduction, I am Kristen Hedges. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Grand Valley State University. I am a white woman with medium length brown hair. I'm currently conducting this webinar with approval from my dean in my office. I'm isolated in my office. Right now my house is pretty loud with children at home. So I was thankful to get the approval to use it just to conduct this webinar. I'm the co-chair of the Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies along with Dion Claiborne who is actually in the chat window collecting your questions. Hi. <laughs> and just to give you some information about our group, um, our group is a special interest group of the Society for Medical Anthropology. We were formed in 2017. The purpose of our group is to network among people in public health and social science in any kind of health related circumstance to rapidly develop a response to a health emergencies. So far, our group has worked on Zika, Ebola, measles outbreak, and now COVID-19. If you would like to join our group, or we've got the link to our Facebook page. We do keep things pretty virtual so we can quickly respond. Um, and we also have started an expertise database that is a quick five minute Google form. Our idea is we would like to have experts already in the database. That way when something new, a new infection pops up like this, we can quickly see who we could turn to to ask for advice from. So the link is here. It only takes five minutes. I think Dion is also gonna post this link a few times throughout the webinar in the chat box. We would encourage everybody, even if you do not consider yourself an expert, there's some advice you could probably possibly offer. So please uh, consider filling that out. So our outline, this is our outline of speakers, and I'm gonna have each speaker, if they could introduce themselves, that way people can connect the video icon with who is speaking and give a description. So we will start with Jennifer Nuzzo. Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer Nuzzo. I'm an epidemiologist uh, who works on uh, outbreak detection response and uh, particularly I conduct operational research um, in collaboration with outbreak responders uh, to identify how we can improve response to future uh, you know, outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. All right, thanks Jennifer. 
And Jennifer, can you give a description of yourself and where you're at for those that could um, be on our webinar who are visually impaired? Oh, sure. And I haven't turned on my video because I've found that the bandwidth in my, with all of us teleworking at home, um, that you're not going to hear, you're going to hear a distorted voice. So I am also a white woman with curly uh, brownish hair, and I'm sitting in a spare bedroom in my house with children. Hopefully that won't come busting in in the middle of this. All right. Thank you. Samuel Spies. Hi, I'm Sam Spies. I'm a program officer at the Social Science Research Council, and I'm a managing editor of MediaWell, which is the SSRC's platform to track research on dis and misinformation um, across the social sciences and distill that research for a general audience. I'm a white male. I'm sitting against a uh, beige wall and a gray curtain, and I have a black and white cat over my left shoulder who will probably appear in the video at some point. Thank you, Sam. And Monica? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Monica Shoxpana. I work with Jennifer at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, trained in cultural anthropology, and for the last 20 years have worked on the role of the community in managing epidemics and disasters, uh, and also having the public engage in health emergency policy making. The Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security uh, is functions as a think tank. So our role is to influence policy and practice in ways that would reduce human suffering during extreme events and their aftermath. And Monica, can you include? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I am a white woman, mid fifties, proudly middle-aged. Uh, I am in my home and my uh, teenage son's door is nearby. He may come stumbling out because it's about that time for him to get up. So apologies in advance. All right, thank you. So this is the order that we are gonna go through our webinar and then we will finish with a question and answer session. Um, so if you have questions throughout, submit them in the chat function and we will try to collate all those to get everybody's questions answered. And we will pass it back to Jennifer to go ahead and start us off. Great, thank you. And you're gonna drive the slides, right, Kristen? Yes, I am. If you just tell okay. me, I can do that. Great, go ahead. You can advance to the next one, thank you. Okay, great. So, um, and I'm glad that, Kristen, you gave the appropriate kind of caveats about uh, our knowledge of the situation and the fact that this is very much a situation in flux. And um, what I'm saying today might very well um, be different uh, next week. And so um, just wanted to kind of reiterate that. Um, but nonetheless, I'm going to try to tell you what we think we know now, um, what we still don't know now, and um, despite all of that, what we think now might happen uh, in the future. And just to kind of set the kind of tone from sort of a, an epidemiologic kind of public health um, uh, perspective, um, and then hopefully it'll kind of inform the, the conversations that follow. Um, I just wanted to say that this uh, pandemic that we now find ourselves in is one that our group um, has been tracking since really we heard the first reports coming out of China of an outbreak of viral pneumonia. Um, as I mentioned on the introduction, I conduct um, operational research to uh, better understand uh, outbreak response so that we can inform future preparedness. Um, I do this as part of the outbreak observatory. And one of the functions of the outbreak observatory in addition to doing these research studies is also to publish a weekly blog. And so uh, just kind of a screenshot here on January 2nd, we wrote about um, what was then being referred to as a outbreak of unknown um, viral pneumonia in China. And um, most of our reflections in that post was about how there were strong suspicions that this was due to a SARS-like virus, but um, we tried to review what evidence, if any, existed for that. As you may remember, when this first started, um, it seemed uh, linked to a seafood market in uh, Wuhan, China. Um, that was actually, that, that link was actually how um, astute clinicians notified health authorities that something unusual was happening. Um, having a bunch of patients with viral pneumonia uh, in a hospital in the midst of flu season is not by itself unusual, but the astute clinicians had noticed that a number of them seemed to have an occupational connection to the seafood market. And that initially Kind of tipped off worries that that would be sort of an unusual coincidence and so they began looking at this market 
as a potential source of this outbreak. Um, and, you know, initially it seemed just from the data that this was possibly due to some kind of point exposure at the, out at the market that people who um, may have been there or worked there may have been exposed to something while they were there. Um, we now know that that's very much not the case, that this is a virus that's capable of human to human transmission. It is expanded beyond Wuhan and it is a uh, virus that um, may not have really been linked to this market in the first place. That may have just been a place where a number of people infected each other because they were symptomatic and, and coughing on one of an another. Next slide, please. Um, so what do we now know? Uh, next slide. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we know now is that this is a um, virus capable of sustained human to human transmission. Um, this is one of the first studies that kind of showed the early transmission dynamics of um, COVID-19. And I think an important takeaway from this graphic that I'm showing here, which shows a sort of the first um, epidemiologic curve um, that plots the number of cases by their date of symptom onset, um, is that this situation likely began much earlier than we initially thought. Poss the first cases possibly occurred in the beginning of December. It's even possible that they occurred earlier than that, um, which really raises important, I think, questions about um, what measures countries should take. And there was clearly a, a fair amount of travel that occurred before anybody kind of really started paying attention. And so I think a lot of our efforts to try to identify where the virus went and where it is, you know, was possibly blinded by not understanding when it as early, you know, that it started as early as it did. Next slide. Another thing that we understand now about this virus is that it's capable of causing a spectrum of illness. And so it's been reported over and over again, and this comes from initially the World Health Organization, that about 80% um, of the cases um, to date are, have experienced mild illness, um, which is you know, somewhat good news, but there are clearly, um, uh, you know, that leaves the remaining 20% that experience um, severe and critical illness and then ultimately results in death. There have been now studies that have looked at um, factors associated with uh, critical illness and death. And here's um, just one of the studies that was one of the early studies that identified some of the um, factors that are associated with that. And you, as you can see, it's, you know, a lot of these chronic illnesses that we often worry about, like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, some other risk factors such as um, cancer, uh, you know, people undergoing cancer treatment and, you know, um, lung disease have also subsequently been identified. Um, another important um, aspect of um, the, you know, another factor that's also been um, associated with uh, more severe illness and death is age. And we haven't fully done the, the delinking to see whether it's age by itself or if it's age as a function of that's when you tend to accumulate a lot of these underlying conditions. But nonetheless, um, you know, uh, the vast majority of deaths have occurred among the elderly. Next slide, please. Um, there's been some question about the extent to which uh, the disease affects children. Um, most of the surveillance numbers do not seem to include pediatric cases. Um, we have some studies now that have demonstrate that kids can get the virus um, and can be infected. And um, they generally, when they do, um, when we do find kids with the virus, um, they tend to have milder illness than adults. Um, though, um, you know, a recent study did suggest um, that uh, severe or critical illness is possible, um, though in a, a small number of documented cases. Um, I think, you know, for me as an epidemiologist, when I look at these numbers, it is somewhat reassuring um, just because we know, like if we compare it to flu, where children are particularly hard hit by flu, um, this is somewhat reassuring. But, you know, I think this situation is again in flux. And so it's um, the absence of data is not necessarily the absence of, of a relationship. So um, I think so far early encouraging data on children, but we should um, obviously continue to, to pay attention to that. Next slide. So that's what we know. Um, and now just kind of reflecting on what we don't know. And um, unfortunately, these, these, these are the big questions. And I think they really um, you know, influence uh, how we are responding to this situation. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, there is a range of, um, of you know, this, the virus is known to cause a spectrum of illness. And I mentioned the WHO data about 82% of reported cases being mild. Um, but it raises the question of how severe is this virus? You know, what fraction of people who are infected develop severe illness and die? And unfortunately, we, we just don't have great numbers um, for that. If you just did the raw math where you divided the total number of reported deaths into the total number of reported cases, for a long time, you would get a 2% number. Um, in recent weeks, that number has ticked up to be over 3%. Um, but this is, I think, a very um, inaccurate calculation because it's very heavily influenced by surveillance. And in most parts of the world, surveillance is biased to find severe cases. Um, there has been some interest in looking at the Diamond Princess. If you remember the news reports about this cruise ship that was uh, stuck off the coast of Japan for a long time. Um, as a way to kind of, as a you know, natural experiment of what the case fatality was because it represented a situation in which you had thousands of passengers potentially being exposed and limited diagnostics on board um, in order to uh, you know, intervene and possibly interrupt transmission. Um, looking at that and sort of trying to extrapolate that, I won't go into too much detail, um, it's possible that the, um, the it's possible to estimate that the, um, you know, in, uh, case fatality ratios and infection fatality ratios um, might be lower, might be closer to, to 1% or possibly lower. But again, huge uncertainty here. We don't really know. Next slide. Um, there's been a lot of comparisons in, in sort of uh, fatalities to influenza, a lot of kind of, you know, the president of the United States for a while was trying to liken this to a seasonal flu. Um, again, with all the caveats that we don't really know what percentage of those who become infected are likely to die or be hospitalized because we don't know how many people are infected. We only just know the cases that we find and we know that we are over finding you know, overrepresenting our, our surveillance with severe cases. Um, still, if we just do the raw calculations, which are obviously um, flawed, uh, this is still something that's likely more severe than seasonal influenza. Next slide. Um, these are uh, kind of just pictures from the World Health Organization as of uh, the 16th. And just to show you that we're now in a situation where um, you know, we're approaching 200,000 cases being reported worldwide. This number jumps up remarkably each day. And, uh, you know, many, many countries across the world are reporting cases. Um, I very strongly believe that these case numbers and um, dots on the map are not truly reflective of the situation that we're seeing in so much as if a country doesn't have a dot, I don't think that we can say that that country doesn't have uh, the disease. Um, we have to remember that, um, you know, our last pandemic was in 2009 and it was H1N1 influenza. Influenza is a disease for which we have, uh, we routinely conduct surveillance where there is a surveillance infrastructure. It, granted, it may be weak in some parts of the world, but there is still kind of a backbone to build upon. What we're essentially asking countries to do now is to stand up surveillance for a completely new virus. So um, I don't think we should assume that because a country hasn't reported cases, it doesn't have it. I also don't think we should assume that um, there aren't other factors that may influence countries' surveillance beyond just technical ones. And so, um, if, like as an example, if you look at the case numbers in Russia, they're very small and they appear, appear to all only be in people who have traveled, um, which I just don't think is realistic given how um, the disease is, is unfolding in, in other countries. Next slide. Um, here's uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID uh, tracker that was, um, that was developed by Lauren Gardner, a professor in the School of Engineering. Um, this is really one of the best uh, tools for seeing more up-to-date assessment of the number of cases. And as I said, you know, we're, we've um, exceeded actually 200,000 cases. Um, and as you can see, um, this provides kind of, a, I think, a better picture of um, where cases are being reported um, than the WHO, which, uh, you know, it, is on a different time frame for updating their numbers. Next slide. Uh, right now, the situation 
that we're seeing is that um, the majority of spread is occurring outside of China. And you'll see um, there's going to be a series of news articles talking about how the, re the remarkability, you know, the, the remarkable approach that China has taken and how they've really um, dropped their transmission to the point where, you know, they're reporting a handful of cases each day as opposed to several thousand in a day at the peak. Um, contrast that with Europe right now, which is really sort of um, rapidly expanding in its number of cases um, and, you know, has been sort of identified as a hotspot. Again, I'm always nervous to say that, you know, one place has it more than another because I still think that surveillance is so weak, but um, clearly you can't ignore the epidemics that are happening um, within Europe. Next slide. Um, after, you know, China, after we got wind of this, you know, epidemic that was occurring in China and the fact that, um, you know, it was growing quite rapidly and um, it seemed to be capable of sustained human to human transmission, a number of countries responded by implementing bans on travel from China. And um, it's been a point of discussion as to the, you know, um, effect that these bans have had. Um, consider me in the skeptical category and one of the reasons why I've been skeptical about the impact of these is that I have believed that the virus was likely moving about the planet much earlier and that countries that didn't yet have it um, were probably just not looking for it. And um, here's just a graphic that was produced by um, the Council on Foreign Relations and what it shows is um, the days after a country has ex um, implemented a travel ban um, or not, how its number of confirmed cases have grown. And what it shows is that, um, you know, a number of the countries that implemented travel bans um, saw very large, you know, uh, um, increases in uh, their their epidemics regardless. So um, it's, it's hard for me to take away from this that this is the, the right approach to controlling this virus. Next slide. I mentioned that our surveillance is biased to find um, severe cases, and it was also biased um, geographically for a long time. This is um, guidelines from the CDC that existed up until very recently. Um, we, for a long time, made no efforts to find cases outside of anyone who had traveled from China. And so as we are claiming credit that the travel bans from China that were implemented at the end of January bought us time, um, it's possible that those bans reduced the number of importations of virus. Um, but as this uh, table indicates, um, it spells out the criteria for testing people for uh, COVID-19. Um, we were essentially only testing people who had traveled from Wuhan specifically. And if they had traveled from broader, broader China, then um, they needed to be sick enough to be hospitalized. So we never did the testing for a long time to find out whether the virus was already circulating in the United States outside of people who had traveled from China. And it stands to reason if you reduce the number of people traveling from China and you keep your surveillance fixated on people who have traveled from China, you're not gonna find any cases or you'll find very few cases. Next slide. Um, everyone right now is looking at Italy with much worry. Um, their epidemic is growing um, quite significantly. You know, I think they're over, they're approaching 40,000 cases, um, very high uh, fatality um, reports there as well. And um, in part, a lot of the worry is about how the demand for um, hospital resources, particularly critical care is, is uh, about to outpace supply in, in Italy and, and availability. And um, there's been a lot of comparisons to case numbers here in the United States and people asking if in the United States we are you know, two weeks away from being Italy, just where our case numbers are. Um, I think this situation is absolutely cause for worry, but I do think there are some social factors that may also be at play here, um, namely that the epidemic in Italy is very heavily overweighted with um, elderly uh, patients, which, as I mentioned, are more likely to develop severe illness and death. And we can contrast that with epidemics that have occurred in other countries that have had younger patients and haven't had nearly the same kind of strain on their health systems. So lots of context that I think needs to be brought to an interpretation of these numbers, and particularly as we're trying to predict what could happen 
elsewhere. Next slide. A question I frequently get from just family and members, you know, just people generally in the public conversations that I have, and also crucially with members of the press, is how long will this situation last? And in particular, they're referring to the actions that states and countries are taking to try to stop the spread of this virus. You know, in many states, they've closed schools, canceled public gatherings, in some cases, closed restaurants and bars. Here in Maryland, they just announced uh, that they're going to close other stores like the shopping malls, et cetera. And I think we'll continue to see kind of a wave of closures as governments become increasingly concerned about the need to um, reduce transmission, in particular, so that the health system isn't overwhelmed. All of these social distancing measures that are being pursued are not necessarily in an attempt to change the number of people who become infected in the end but to try to slow it down and to spread it out over a longer period of time, such that we um, have fewer people sick on any one day, which hopefully will put less strain on a probably over already taxed health system. And that's really important because um, there's this modeling, this, this um, graphic I'm showing here has a bunch of um, kind of simulated curves of cases and showing different scenarios. It was produced by the Imperial College of London, so a modeling group there that have looked at various different control strategies. And they essentially concluded that um, government basically has to shut it all down or do a lot of it um, and possibly do it a, a lot of it for 18 months. And they used 18 months as a cutoff because that's one of the estimates that's been thrown around for the availability of disease. Um, this is obviously quite worrisome because it's hard for me to imagine that societies can continue to function under this level of restriction for that long. Um, 18 months is also not a magic number because although it's possible that we could have, you know, a, a promising vaccine at that point, it's not clear to me that we will have any um, meaningful qual quantities of vaccine at that point. And so um, I think it's at least raising questions of what's to come next and truly how long will this last? Um, this is absent any kind of speculation as to um, whether the virus will go away in the warmer weather. Um, people are speculating, but there's no data now um, to support that or to even answer that question. This is just, you know, if the function of these measures is to um, slow down the speed at which people become sick, what that essentially means is that you pretty much have to maintain it until you find a way to protect people. And even if we look at places like China that have been able to reduce their um, infections through very, very aggressive measures, um, they remain susceptible. And so as they go back to work, as long as the virus is still out there, um, they could very well see, and I think people expect to see a rise in their case numbers again. And so the question is, what do you do to stop that or to deal with that? Do you have to go back to those measures? And I think that's a question that no one has been able to answer, unfortunately. And this is a question that I think cannot purely be um, answered in epidemiological terms, because I think this is a societal question about our values and what we think we can bear and what we think are appropriate choices. And so I think this really has to be informed by a larger community than just epidemic modelers. Next slide. That was a really depressing slide and I didn't want to end on it. So I just wanted to point to um, just some progress that's been made in some countries, recognizing of course that progress is, is potentially temporary. But um, here's Singapore. They did not take the kind of aggressive approaches that China did. They um, have been able to bring down their incidents in cases largely through traditional public health methods of rapid case identification, isolation of cases, quarantine, identification of contacts and quarantining of contacts. They didn't do things like closed schools. Um, they had a very kind of um, active, they had high degree of transparency in terms of their case numbers and the epidemiologic investigation around each of the cases. They had a leadership that was talking about um, you know, what to expect and talking regularly, including the fact that though they have had much success in their response, um, that they should not expect that this will be a permanent situation, that they could very well see case numbers rise again, particularly as the rest of the world um, experiences cases and they've acknowledged that Singapore can't wall itself off from the rest of the world. 
I'll also point out that Singapore did not have many cases over the age of 65 like Italy has. So um, though I think we should be inspired by some of the successes that they have, it's questionable how much um, we can generalize from their experience. Next slide. And similarly with South Korea, people are pointing to South Korea as being particularly successful. I think one of the, um, is, as you can see with the green bars uh, that are decreasing, um, they have been able to reduce the number of cases beyond what would have been predicted just based on the initial growth in cases. So if you've heard the term, we're trying to flatten the curve, here's evidence that South Korea has. They've been able to do it through very aggressive um, testing um, they've tested more than 200,000 uh, people to date, which is um, above and beyond what any other government has been able to do. They also have, um, uh, so they're able to much more quickly find cases and isolate cases. Um, and they've also been very aggressive in their efforts to do contact tracing. Um, they have only been able to be that successful in contact tracing because they're using cell phones to see who is in contact with each other which um, is uh, potentially an effective uh, epidemiologic tool. Um, I think it does though raise questions about, you know, whether that truly is the right approach. I think there are some larger societal questions that have to be um, addressed um, before we just, um, you know, think about applying those technologies. But I do think it shows some progress and um, I do wanna kind of leave this more on a positive note because this is an otherwise, um, Kind of dreary topic and I don't want to leave everybody depressed. Um, I, I think there's more that can be done but I do think that we need to address these questions more fully and frankly with the contributions of other communities that have um, rele relevant research and perspectives to bring to the table and not just have it be led by you know the modeling and and the epi approaches. So I think that's the last slide. Yep, just my contact information if um, anyone has any follow-up questions that we're not able to address in the webinar. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jennifer. We are now gonna pop it over to Sam. If you use it, right? uh, one moment, one moment, Kristen. Uh, a quick housekeeping note, please everyone, we wanna capture all your questions. If you could please put at the beginning of your question, all in caps, question. Then it stands out for those of us that are trying to find them all on chat, and we can make sure that we get them to the speakers to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right. everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. Um, I'm a little under the weather myself, so forgive my voice if I'm a little hoarse. I'm Sam Spees. I'm a program officer at the Social Science Research Council and the managing editor of MediaWell, which is the SSRC's platform to track research on dis and misinformation across the social sciences and distill that research for a general audience. I'm an anthropologist by training and I studied responses to censorship at online media outlets in Jordan. Can I get my first slide, please? I wanna start with a couple of caveats. Um, one is that mis and disinformation research involves a lot of uncertainty and it takes a lot of time. So what we think we know may look very different in, say, six months. Uh, for example, it's still very hard to get a complete picture of what happened in the 2016 US elections. So without independent access to platform research data about this outbreak, we're unlikely to ever know for sure in this crisis how misinformation is being spread or how disinformation is being propagated. Can I get my next slide? The second caveat is that what I'm talking about today is synthesized from a lot of research and news reports, but none of it is my original research. So please, instead of quoting me or using what I say here as a basis for social media posts, please get in touch with me and let me point you to the original material. You can do so through these contact links. This slide shows the contact links. Our URL is mediawell.ssrc.org. Our email address is mediawell at ssrc.org. You'll notice that I'm talking about dis and misinformation together, and that's deliberate. The definitions that have become most prominent distinguish these two based on intention. Disinformation tends to be defined as false information that is deliberately spread in order to harm, confuse, mobilize, or demobilize its audience. Misinformation is unintentionally spread and tends to harm, confuse, mobilize, demobilize. 
Intent is notoriously difficult to measure, however, and what we see is that a given narrative can shift constantly back and forth between intentional disinfo and unintentional misinfo. And for people producing disinformation, that's exactly what they want. The upshot is that dis and misinfo narratives exist in this highly liminal space online. I have a literature review up on MediaWell on this definitional problem if you're interested in, in learning more, but that's the TLDR version. First, I want to talk a little bit generally about what we've learned about dis and misinformation flows. Most of this comes from and pertains to the US because a lot of this research was prompted by the 2016 presidential election, but there are elements that apply elsewhere. And in general, we need much more research into disinformation dynamics in other places because we know that they're highly influenced by local context. If we look around, it certainly seems as if there's a huge amount of misinformation circulating, both in regard to COVID-19 and other topics. And in some absolute sense, that is true. And it has had deadly consequences. For example, we've seen dozens of deaths in Iran, according to news reports, from fake cures involving bootleg alcohol and people are quite legitimately scared. Globally speaking, the dominant sentiment on social media surrounding COVID-19 is fear, and the kinds of messages we see varies. In some places, the most popular tweets are about celebrities maybe making donations. Elsewhere, they're about cures that have been found or theories that the virus was made in a lab. Jake Shapiro and the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project at Princeton have been compiling a list of narratives, and some of their categorizations of the false narratives are anti-China, non-vaccine remedies, speculations about the source, a U.S. bioweapons plot, and that this is a plot to weaken and discredit Trump. Soon, uh, the Shapiro and his colleagues will be making daily updates at the ESOC site. But in order to get a sense of how major this misinformation problem is, we have to weigh the misinformation that's circulating against the total body of circulating information, which is very difficult to do, if not impossible. But it's possible that the percentage of false narratives circulating within the larger conversation is maybe very, very small. It's also possible that the prevalence of bogus info may be declining as this larger conversation grows. I'll return to this later, but one of the lessons of the 2016 US election is that effects stemming from the concern over the idea of disinformation, expressed then as fake news, were greater than any measurable effects that the disinformation itself had. Back then, we saw news reports about tens of thousands of bogus accounts being taken down. But unless those reports are put in context against the millions of non-bogus accounts, we don't get a true picture of the issue. There's a study with a good indication that exposure to election-related mis- and disinfo online was actually fairly low, and that misinformation sharing behavior among most social media users in the US is fairly rare. If we get more evidence that that's true, that's going to be really encouraging. But what we also see is that there are some actors who share a lot of mis- and disinformation online. In the US media scape, there are extremely dense and interconnected clusters of conspiracy sites, social media influencers, far-right organizations, and right-wing media outlets. Production and spread of mis- and disinfo in the US is disproportionately higher on the political right. This is not to say that US political conservatives are more susceptible to misinformation, but it does mean that their daily information environment is saturated with highly polarized, if not outright false information to an extremely high degree. And here I'm referencing Yohai Benkler's work. The right-leaning professional news organizations like Fox are closely interwoven with these clusters in a way that centrist and left-leaning news organizations are not. With COVID-19, we do not know if these same dynamics hold true or if misinformation nodes are more evenly dispersed, and if these clusters are not as dense. Another interesting point is that the disinformation industry has some ties with what I'll call the alternative treatments industry. Alex Jones makes his money by selling a wide range of unproven dietary supplements that make claims to things like advanced neural activation. And he's raised prices on the bulk food he sells on his site since the outbreak. He's not alone. Other conspiracy sites blend health disinformation with far-right conspiracies, and some sell supplement products directly to their audience. 
And so there are certain actors who have a commercial interest in further eroding public trust in institutions in general, and particularly in evidence-based science and medicine. And this brings us to COVID-19 and the current state of affairs. There have been information vacuums, and we know that in the absence of good information, people will look for any information. There's also a structural disparity between information producers and misinformation spreaders, which is that doctors, scientists, and public health officials are constrained by professional norms and ethics, but our Facebook friends, our politicians, and our grandmothers are not. One of the patterns I've seen in the English language internet is a post that says something like, my friend's relative who works in the health department says they're about to announce a new restriction. And this is a classic rumor framework. It establishes a claim to inside information that sounds quite reasonable, but is completely unverifiable. It also fits existing patterns of actual actions. Governments are announcing new measures all the time and they're increasingly restrictive. I'm speculating here, but I think it's reasonable to think that these messages spread successfully because they so closely match the way that we communicate other facts about our lives. Much of the disinformation that we're seeing circulate is clearly commercially motivated. Jim Baker made the news for touting a treatment scam, but I'm sure we've all seen lots of examples in the past few weeks. And we find that this is true of mis- and disinformation more generally. A lot of people are in it for the money, or perhaps more accurately for the capital, be it social or economic. Disinformation is a growth industry. There's fascinating work by Ong and Campanez about the labor of disinformation in the Philippines, and they show how easily and fluidly the commercial intertwines with the political. Elsewhere, there are trolls for hire, but it's hard to get a sense of who they are and how strongly their paid trolling is aligned with their own political orientations or whether they're really just in it for the money. We've started to see evidence that unscrupulous PR firms and consultants are willing to use coordinated disinformation tactics for their clients, further blurring the commercial and the political. This is an area where we need a lot more ethnography to understand how disinformation labor markets function in global contexts. The other dynamic that I think we're seeing with COVID-19 is that much of the misinformation that's circulating, for lack of a better word, seems to be grassroots. In other words, some people, and again, it's very hard to say how many, are spreading conspiracy theories and fake cures from person to person in an organic way, and perhaps with the best of intentions. Without independent access to platform data, it's going to be impossible to know for sure if this is true. I say organic because that tends to be the word that's used in disinformation studies to mean the opposite of coordinated, like a coordinated attack from a state actor um, when we're talking about social media disinformation. But organic is not a great term because it obscures the way that social media platforms and their algorithms juice content that they've learned will generate engagement. And that's content that is polarizing, inflammatory, extreme, and emotionally activating. So there's very little that's truly organic about social media communication, though this varies from platform to a platform with their, with their respective affordances. There was a report in Politico the other day about audio messages on WhatsApp spreading virus misinfo, and Claire Wardle made the point that audio is an emotional medium, and there's evidence that emotion plays or can play a strong role in what content spreads and resonates on social media. In terms of coordinated disinformation activity or inauthentic disinformation activity related to coronavirus, we have seen some allegations that foreign agents are targeting the US with disinformation. I've seen allegations that there's coordinated activity pushing conspiracy narratives that the CIA is responsible for the virus, for example. And the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Lab published a post in late January saying that fringe outlets aligned with the Kremlin are pushing narratives that blame the US. However, I want to see more data before I draw any conclusions about this, especially about how widespread this behavior is. That said, what we've seen from the 2016 and 2018 elections, as well as elsewhere in the world, is that disinformation producers are opportunistic and flexible. And as disinformation narratives bubble up from dark corners of the internet, these producers see what gains attention and they pivot their sock puppet accounts and their bots onto these new narratives. There's some evidence that state-sponsored or state-aligned disinformation efforts are perhaps less centralized than we might think. We need more ethnography about these actors to understand who they are and how they work. 
All that is to say is that if there are state-aligned actors aiming COVID-19 disinformation at U.S. audiences, or anywhere else for that matter, we don't yet know how widespread or how centralized those efforts are. Finally, there's the role of elites in the promulgation of dis and misinformation. And in the US, as well as elsewhere, a major engine of misinformation on COVID-19 thus far has been elected officials. Our professional journalism outlets have still not figured out how to consistently report on misinformation without amplifying it. Much of the US news establishment is still producing stenographic, both sizes journalism that reinforces existing power structures and allows elites to act with rhetorical impunity. There's a difference between publishing a headline that says, President plays down coronavirus, and one that says, President pushes false claims about coronavirus. I used to commit journalism myself, and it's not easy to convince editors to make declarative statements, even when they know them to be true but we can and we must. The news industry is in terrible shape, but I think anthropologists can work with journalists, God bless them, in their local communities and in their field sites and try to affect this change. And this brings me to the idea of mitigation and what we can do to promote science and evidence-based public health information. Specifically related to health misinfo in the current outbreak, the pump has been primed for a very long time. We've had health-related misinformation as long as we've had concepts of disease. With varying degrees of good faith, people have promoting tonics and cure-alls for centuries, and states have responded with various regulatory measures. I did a little experiment earlier this week where I searched for coronavirus cures. Next slide, please. If you put coronavirus into Google Shopping, you get nothing. This slide shows uh, an empty search result page from Google for coronavirus. They have turned off that tap, and this is great, and it's an obvious and necessary mitigation effort. But if you put an immune system, next slide please, you get this. This slide shows uh, Google Shopping results for a variety of supplements ranging from uh, about 19 US dollars to about 70 US dollars. I'm not here to say that these products do or don't work, because I don't know. But I do know that they have not been proven to work and yet their messages exist in our information environment. By the way, I love that this one, I don't know if you can see it down at the bottom, it says combat employee illness and lost productivity. Doctors say to help your immune system, you should get more sleep, eat a healthy diet, reduce stress and get more exercise. And that's a hard message to convey at the best of times. And these are not the best of times. We would all rather take a pill. In the US, there's a $40 billion dietary supplements industry based around the idea that we as individuals can take charge of our own health care and that as individuals, we know what is best for ourselves and our families. And that kind of agency and autonomy is great and we should encourage it, but I worry that it comes at the cost of ignoring scientific expertise, contributing to an information environment in which all facts are debatable, rejecting vaccines and cures that work, and spending money on things that don't. And that's the information environment in which COVID-19 made its entrance. And that brings me to my next point, which is that we are all susceptible to misinformation in various point forms. Some of it comes through advertising, some of it comes through news or social media, and some of it we grew up with. To this day, I drink cranberry juice when I'm sick, because my mother told me 30 years ago that vitamin C will shorten cold symptoms. It's not proven to. I'm probably just drinking more sugar. And we all do this kind of thing. It's important to recognize that we all do it because there's evidence of a distinct third party effect when it comes to misinformation. That is that um, in this third party effect, people tend to think that other kinds of people like their political opponents, are more susceptible to misinformation. That third person effect may have significant consequences for mitigation efforts because people might be more likely to support media literacy efforts aimed at others than regulatory efforts that affect everyone. At the same time, while we're all susceptible, there is evidence that some people are more susceptible to misinformation than others and that's people over 65. These are data from the US, but I've seen some corroboration from Europe. 
People over 65 fall for scams more and they're more likely to spread bogus information on social media and in email. Unfortunately, they're also going to be most susceptible to COVID-19 and other diseases. In the US, people over 65 also show the highest increase in political polarization, but are the least likely to use social media. That points to other factors, including intersections between social media and traditional media. Data show that there's been a decline in trust in institutions and expertise in the US for decades. And I suspect that the same can be, can be shown to be true in many other parts of the world, and sometimes for very good reasons. Yohai Benkler has a compelling essay up on MediaWell that makes the case that this crisis of epistemology is related to growing wealth disparity and a sense that political systems are rigged for elites and the neoliberal project. I mentioned earlier the idea that in the 2016 US election, the concept of disinformation had greater effects than disinformation itself, and I want to return to that. There's a widespread popular narrative that Russian interference on social media swung the US election but we have no evidence for that. The best data sets that are available show no measurable effects on voting behavior related to disinformation, though of course measuring these effects is notoriously hard. But the existence of disinformation itself has potentially huge follow-on effects, and in some ways that's what we really need to be worried about. Dave Karp has an essay up on our site that sums this up really well. And his point is that if the disinformation environment undermines the democratic myth that attentive publics hold politicians responsible for their statements and actions, then that unravels the fabric of democratic society. I'm summarizing a lot here, but the upshot is that the presence of disinformation can have effects even if the content itself doesn't have measurable effects on voting behavior. Disinformation doesn't have to convince in order to cause effects. And I'm also going to try to end on a more hopeful note. By and large, corrections on social media probably work. It is worth taking the time to say, no, this is not true, and here's a credible source saying why. Doing that doesn't necessarily convince the original poster, but if you correct someone, that can have a positive effect on other readers who see both posts. Fact checking can work if it's done right. There are ways to do journalism that debunk without amplifying. And with COVID-19, we've also seen the social media platforms be more proactive and more effective at slowing spread and de-emphasizing bogus info. In this instance, that's really good. They've shown in the past that they're unwilling or unable to moderate content at scale on other topics. And it likely helps that they don't need political cover to address disease in the same way that they think they do to address immigration or misogyny or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, etc. But they're doing it now and it makes me hope. Can I get my last slide, please? So I think it's possible to affect some change on the individual level. Corrections can work. Reporting sock puppets to the platforms can work. Compassionately teaching our friends and relatives to be good information consumers can work. As anthropologists, we can fill a huge hole in disinformation studies about the labor practices of disinformation and how misinformation functions differently in post-colonial contexts and in the global south. We can help journalists in our local communities and that includes sending messages of support when they get it right. That's all I have. I have tried not to misinform you. I sincerely hope I haven't. I wish you all continued good health and don't touch your face. Thank you so much, Sam. And next up is Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to Jen and Sam for really engaging talks and to uh, Kristen and, and the organizers for this opportunity to talk with you. I've been asked to clean up our conversation with the topic of now what? What do we do? So if I could have the next slide. For those of you who are tuning in to the information strictly through audio, I do not have uh, graphics or images. It's strict text, and I will go through those with you. Quickly, I just want to give an overview of my six points of action for those of you um, on this communal call. The first is we need to remember who we are. What is our mission? Are our missions as anthropologists? The second is we really need to seize th this teachable moment. We know a lot about this space. We need to educate a variety of audiences about what we know. 
Thirdly, we need to join the pandemic response brigade. There is no single discipline who has an answer to the complex challenge of COVID-19 and other uh, outbreaks of emerging infect infectious disease. Fourthly, we need to engage with the dominant narratives that are being used to describe and organize the response to COVID-19. Fifthly, we need to do research that cuts uh, down the social risks that are associated both with the epidemics and the official responses to them. And lastly, we need to be human. We need to model for one another and for those of us around us what it is to maintain human connections in a context of contagion. Can I have the next slide, please? So when I was putting my uh, talk together, I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to our uh, code of ethics because I think occasionally we need to recalibrate, particularly in uh, what is now a global scale crisis of various kinds. Of course, there are local manifestations, but the world is having a problem. So what's our responsibility in this context? So we have out of the AAA Ethics Forum, the quote that anthropology is an irreducibly social enterprise. And among our goals are disseminating anthropologic knowledge and its use to solve human problems. So here we are, we've been tasked with solving problems. From the Society for Applied Anthropology, our uh, code of ethics there uh, include Provide training which is informed, accurate, and relevant to the needs of the larger society. All right, we're educators. It's time for education during this pandemic. And then lastly, also from the Society for Applied Anthropology, to society as a whole, we owe the benefit of our special knowledge and skills in interpreting socio-cultural systems. And we need to communicate out our understanding of human life to society at large. So we need to educate, we need to communicate, we need to train, um, and we need to do it in ways that are accessible to a variety of audiences. Um, our next action, our second action, next slide please, is seizing the teachable moment. All right, there are very urgent and waiting, weighty issues that are permeating this pandemic, and they are squarely in our wheelhouse, all right? The first is, that there are more, but I just wanted to give some illustrations of our existing knowledge base that can be used to intervene in this pandemic and reduce both physical and social suffering, also political suffering. And the first question or issue is that of stigma, right? Um, and uh, so we saw when, when this, um, when this uh, emerging infectious disease first came on the scene, that uh, it originated or was first detected in China. So we had all eyes on China at the time. Um, we had framing of the disease in terms of um, its Chinese origins. And because people tend to, in pandemics, to sort the world into safe places, unsafe places, safe people, and unsafe people as a way to get a handle on an uncertain, potentially uh, uh, an uncertain, a, fright, a frightening, and potentially um, uh, physically dangerous scenario, um, people use mental maps to, to negotiate that, that uh, threat and that uh, fear. At the same time, that can get mapped onto pre-existing social hierarchies. And, and that is why we see the xenophobia and the racism um, uh, growing up alongside uh, fear with regard to this particular disease. Um, sadly, we are seeing yet another spike in the use of naming practices to uh, continue to uh, perpetrate stigmatization. Um, We've seen uh, the disease called uh, as being uh, started by the Wuhan virus. Uh, uh, I, I can barely say uh, Kung flu um, and also the Chinese virus. So this is not going away. It's probably going to get worse 
in terms of the stigmatization that would be attached to individuals of all backgrounds uh, that may come down with the disease, as well as caregivers who treat them. We know a lot about human sociality, okay? Um, we can, as social scientists, uh, identify those unintended adverse effects of social distancing or non-pharmaceutical interventions that are used to uh, interrupt viral transmission. Uh, I think we need to come up with greater instructions around how we preserve solidarity at the same time that we are told to keep a physical distance from people around us. A third area where we can weigh in right away, we don't have to do new research here, folks, is the social determinants of health. Now, it's a pandemic, it's an entirely new pathogen. So the virus may not discriminate, but its health impacts certainly do. And if you look at past outbreaks, you can see that there are uneven effects throughout societies that are riven with inequality. So during the 2009 H1N1 uh, influenza pandemic, um, we had racial and ethnic minorities in the United States experiencing higher rates of complications, hospitalizations, and mortalities. We need to weigh in on this. And then lastly, what else can we use in terms of our existing research for this teachable moment? Um, is to weigh in on those factors that would enable various individuals and groups to actually act on well-intended advice from public health authorities about how to protect themselves and their communities amidst the pandemic. Oftentimes there's an assumption that the public is ignorant, we just have to fill their empty heads with information and they'll do what we want. But we know that there are on the ground realities that can keep uh, an individual or a particular group of, of people from doing what has been called um, uh, doing and complying with uh, and adhering to public health interventions. So let's weigh in on these issues right now. And I know many of you have already, okay? So let's use our existing uh, uh, research and knowledge base to counter, uh, counter and raise awareness of these elements. I think too, um, we need to, you know, break down those classroom walls. We have to reach non-traditional learners. For those of you who, like myself, are struggling with the uh, remote teaching experience, let's continue to reach our, our traditional students. But we, right now, we have to reach out to decision makers, to journalists, to our neighbors, uh, to, you know, our, the people who retweet us. Um, if we're teaching MOOCs out there, let's, let's get something on um, COVID-19 uh, and the risks and benefits of social, or, or we'll call it physical distancing. Right before I came online, I got a call from uh, Congressman Roger Williams, who's my congressman in district number 25. He had a Q&A by phone. My phone rang, I just picked it up. And he was taking questions. I do hope that something similar is happening in your congressional districts. And if it's not happening now, then call your legislator and offer your expertise in, um, in taking public Q&A on this particular uh, disease. Next slide, please. All right, joining the Pandemic Response Brigade. Right now, we're going to have, or we're already in the, in the middle of an event that's going to be protracted. It's going to have blunt and widespread effects. It's also going to have deep and nuanced effects depending on various communities. Those attributes are going to severely test our current public health and public safety systems. So we need to deepen the bench of the emergency response workforce. Um, and for example, there are interest groups um, within our community that have deep, deep knowledge about the particular needs of, spe of specific uh, groups. 
So the interest group, anthropology of aging, if they haven't, and forgive me if, if work is already going on here, thank you. Um, if more can be done, please do so. But the anthropology of aging interest group can help raise awareness about the challenge of loneliness that uh, senior citizens, uh, and I'll speak from a US context in the United States, uh, experience on a daily basis, let alone during a time of uh, physical distancing. Anthropology of children and youth. Parents and caregivers are struggling with how do I help my child get through an environment that is riven with anxiety um, in all the adults around them. Bring your expertise to the table. Um, the alcohol, drug, and tobacco interest group. Right now, substance users who um, are accessing both peer support and also uh, support through behavioral health systems are already experiencing interrupted um, interruption of their support networks. Can you help think about how it is that we can improvise, how they can improvise and, and meet their needs during a pandemic, pandemic setting? The mental health impacts, um, both chronic, acute, and lingering uh, after the fact, because recovery is going to be long and drawn out. Um, that interest group needs to be way to weigh in. Um, to weigh in, uh, you know, the mental psychosocial uh, disruptions with the pandemic and responses to it um, are extraordinary and can be considered uh, a shadow, what I've called a shadow pandemic. Um, dying and bereavement interest group, there will be the experience of loss, there will be complicated grieving, particularly in the context of rising levels of distrust, uh, uh, at least in the United States, and uh, about how well the response is being managed. Forensic anthropologist, I saw a, a note from uh, a medical examiner in a Georgia, state of Georgia uh, county, who worries that they're going to have problems. Is there anything that you guys can do there? Uh, next slide, please. All right, how about rewriting the COVID-19 narrative? Um, I mentioned earlier the, the shadow pandemic. Let's put mental health on the table. There is no parity right now in the United States between physical and mental health, and it's not happening in the pandemic. Uh, we need to work on that bring to the foreground the problem of mental health. We need to broaden understanding of vulnerable populations during the pandemic. Right now, it is very easy for political leaders to talk about elderly being vulnerable to the more, uh, more severe disease, uh, more severe COVID-19 disease. Um, and I do worry about my own elderly frail mother, but there are other vulnerable groups who are going unnoticed or their needs postponed, the incarcerated, racial and ethnic minorities, and detained immigrants. We need to broaden our category, or broaden our narratives around who constitutes a vulnerable population in COVID-19. We need to also question reports of an ignorant, selfish, and panicked public. Right now, communities uh, are being framed in media oftentimes it's fear-driven, reactive, and irrational, right? Why stock up, why have five gallons of a hand sanitizer when 16 ounces will, will do for a month? So we really need to dig into and help people understand what is really driving collective behaviors or so-called panic buying behaviors. Is it because people are facing a, uh, an invisible threat where there's grave uncertainty, and where even doctors and epidemiologists don't have all the facts just yet. Is it because they don't trust the government and how well it is responding, and they're going to take matters into their own hands? So this isn't about irrationality and selfishness. It's about other, other things going on in the context around them. We also need to capture those stories and relay them in public discourse about pro-social and resilient behaviors because people are under a lot of distress and we all need reminders about human courage, strength, ingenuity, and resilience. Um, so that's another way we can rewrite the narrative. And Sam, we can talk more about this uh, 
um, offline, there's a lot of concern about misinformation. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking that people are treating misinformation much like they treat the pathogen, as if that's the problem when it actually could be the well-being of the host. So, you know, it, with misinformation, we need to think of it as um, something that grows in an environment of social fragmentation and political marginalization. Um, and that it alone can't do anything without that um, fertile soil. Uh, next slide. Here, I would ask that we do research that helps cut down epidemic social risks. Um, I think we all need to recognize that we're in a new phase of the human microbe and environmental relationship. So, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board is saying that, you know, quote, we're in a new era of high impact, potentially fast spreading outbreaks that are more frequently detected and increasingly difficult to manage. That came out in last September in the uh, inaugural report. WHO reported nearly uh, 1,500 epidemic events had been tracked in 172 countries uh, uh, between 2011 and 2018. Much like we're seeing a uh, 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 global warming, we're also seeing major transformations in this human microbe environmental matrix. I think we need to grapple with that as anthropologists. Um, and Jen can weigh in this also, the science of epidemics and their management is growing rapidly. And here, the microbiologists, the virologists, the epidemiologists, the biomedically trained folks, and the computational modelers they their science is outpacing ours and we have got to get in the game folks we have got to be at the table uh, and then lastly um right now we're finding out um that the efficacy of certain containment measures is actually pretty sh is not is a, it's uncertain it depends on on the particular intervention such as school closures but it, their socioeconomic impacts are, are, are actually more certain. Um, so we need to help fill out the systematic knowledge we have about the risks and benefits of non-pharmaceutical interventions and whether those risks and benefits are evenly distributed. Next slide, please. And lastly, I leave you with this. We all need to model human connections in the context of contagion. All of us can do this. You may not know a lick about the history of stigma and outbreaks, but I bet you do. Um, you may know nothing about epidemiology and uh, as a background for knowledge. It doesn't matter. There are things that you as a human being, anthropological or not, that you can do. You can pitch in with groceries, supplies, and moral support when elderly and other high-risk groups must avoid public spaces. You can do that in your community. You can help improvise childcare and meal solutions when work and school routines become disrupted for your neighbors. You can love on a hospital worker, okay? They are gonna be seeing less and less of their family the more time passes. They're probably going to be worried a lot about getting sick themselves, particularly given anticipated shortages in personal protective equipment. Um, they may see their coworkers becoming sick. Um, they need some love, folks. So if you can help cook a meal for their family, do it. We all need to learn psychological first aid to help others cope with outbreak-related stress and trauma. It's available for free, six hours of training at the Johns Hopkins Center for Public Health Preparedness. If you're a baker, bake some, bake, bake some muffins and take them to your neighbor. Of course, you know, hand them over safely from infection control. Um, and then connect with family, friends, and coworkers via telephone, text, snail mail, email, Skype, you name it, um, do it. Uh, and I will stop there and turn it over to you, Kristen. All right. Thank you so much, Monica. And thank you to all of our speakers, really. we. 
are running short on time, but I want to assure everybody to begin with that we have been collecting all the questions, the great questions that have been listed in the chat. And what we're gonna do is if you've registered for this, webinar, you are now also registered in our AAA communities page. Whether you're a AAA member or not, you're a part of that page. I have been already on that page. There is a library tab where we can put resources and documents, and I've put some on there already. There's been a number of documents that have been shared in the chat window. Thank you so much for adding more additional documents. So what we'd like to do is add them all into that library source so we have one place to get to them. If we don't get to any of the questions, we'll post them in there. And if our speakers are able to, as time um, is available to them, maybe they can reply to them there. And with that, I wanted to start, let's see, we have a few, we have about 15 minutes left. So I, we have collected some of the questions and I know one that came up a few times, Jen, if you're still on here, maybe you can answer it. One that came up multiple times is in earlier today, um, there was a press conference with President Trump who had used the phrase that that was going up by the hour. And a few people had posted their questions in there, hoping that maybe you could respond to that if um, that is indeed happening. I'm sorry, what was that about the death? To I didn't it cut out for a second. Death toll, what? Uh, President Trump uh, announced in a press conference that death tolls were going up by the hour. And a few people had questions. Um, I mean, I don't think it's by the hour necessarily. I don't think we collect data that rapidly. But yes, I mean, I think we should expect every day to see new cases and deaths. Um, part of it is expanding. We are expanding our surveillance. Um, and as you probably have seen the news, you know that the, the number of tests we're doing is not even close to being enough. Um, and there's a strong push to try to increase the testing. So um, we will see those things go up um, be, as we expand testing. Um, and, you know, just the more people we find having illness, the more deaths we will find, of course. Um, that said, uh, we will not see an impact from the measures that we are employing right now for some time, probably weeks. So just kind of hold that in your head at the same time. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, I wanted to, we've got questions for each one of our speakers, but I wanted to give a chance to kind of rotate around. Um, Sam, one of the questions it seemed maybe geared towards you was looking at, there's lots of projections. And as Jen even mentioned in, in her slides and the one uh, kind of tough slide for everybody, the big question is how long will this last? And kind of looking at projections. And one of the questions was how to look at pro kind of projection articles as misinformation or how to kind of understand how people are wrapping their heads around the length of this. I don't know that I have a really good answer for that, um, which, which I think as a society, that's an answer that we all need to get more comfortable with. Yes. <laughs> I mean, as Jennifer, I, I don't have an answer for it either. I mean, from, from an epi standpoint, we don't have an answer for, for the disease. I mean, I think everybody looks at China and thinks, wow, they've been able to bring it down. But like I said, that's, those effects are temporary. And so I think we have to look simultaneously at two things. How long does the virus persist in our society? And that's partially a function of, of our response. The measures we're taking now could stretch it out, will stretch it out. And then we also have to ask, how long can we maintain this response? And that's a totally separate question. And I, I think we haven't adequately even begun to answer that. And I, this is my worry is that the decisions about what responses we're taking are purely driven by the disease numbers. And I think there are larger factors to consider as well that aren't being discussed as they should be. I, th I think in terms of, of assessing articles and assessing projection, I think we need to use the same tools that, that we've used in the past, which is check sources, um, weigh against what's been published and what we consider to be credible sources elsewhere. There's, um, and then in terms of our sharing behavior, there's something that, that people call the nudge to accuracy or the accuracy nudge, which is to, if, if you encourage people to think just for a couple of seconds about um, the concept of accuracy uh, that uh, before they share an article, that there's some evidence that that can improve 
uh, the, the sort of overall accuracy of what gets shared. I'm paraphrasing a lot there, but but that's sort of the idea. All right, thank you, Jen and Sam for that. Um, one question to you, Monica, someone had asked if there was a good toolkit that you would recommend to combat stigma specifically as we think of as this progresses on and stigma continuing to have impacts and ripple effects. Is there any toolkit you would recommend for people to kind of turn to or refer people sure. to? Sure. Um, the crisis and emergency risk communication or CERC manual that comes out of the uh, Centers for Disease Control um, has some uh, good uh, stigma antidotes that, that are more communicate, communication based. Um, at our website, at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, uh, we put together a two-pager uh, that describes stigmatization, um, uh, xenophobia, and blame, and then also gives um, top communicators, health officials, and elected officials some tips about how they can frame the problem of COVID-19 uh, in ways that uh, enhance solidarity and mitigate stigma. Uh, others on the line may uh, have other uh, suggestions, but I uh, send you at least uh, there to start. All right, great, thank you. And we can add that um, that link to our page too. Um, for maybe this is for Jen or for any of our speakers. There's a few questions asking around comorbidity. If we are seeing one with people, is there any data on comorbidity actually affecting the efficacy of the tests? And then another mm -hmm. angle of comorbidity, thinking of people with chronic conditions that possibly aren't getting the care that they need out of fear of going to the hospital or going to yeah. their healthcare provider. Um, so I assume the comorbidities we're talking about are things like the underlying health issues like um, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, I haven't seen anything to suggest that the test wouldn't be as accurate. The test just kind of swabs the back of somebody's throat and then looks for the presence of genetic material associated with the virus. So I, I can't see why that would be less accurate. Um, but um, I think the latter question about, um, about the whole access to care and whether this will dissuade people. And, and even if they're not personally dissuaded, I mean, we know that health systems are completely pivoting to be canceling other elective procedures and basically, you know, trying to reduce, you know, the number of people who are coming into their facilities, one, so they can focus on the COVID-19 patients, but two, so that they can keep, you know, infections out in, in people who aren't sick enough to be hospitalized. And this I really, really worry about. I mean, we heard stories in China where, you know, if you had, if you were being treated for cancer or HIV, you know, you basically had to forgo treatment because they, they basically said, we, we can't accommodate you right now. And this is well documented in, in epidemic situations, this idea that, um, you know, there are ancillary health impacts. And I, and I think in Monica's, you know, plea to kind of account for some, some of the social impacts of the control measures that we also need to account for the other health impacts. And if we are, you know, um, it's not good if we save somebody's life from COVID-19, but they, desire, they die of something else that could have otherwise been treated. Um, you know, in West Africa, as you probably, I'm sure everybody knows that, you know, the, when you added up all the health-related deaths, the things, the health-related um, impacts beyond just the number of cases was actually quite, quite large and possibly dwarfed dwarfed um, the, just the case numbers. All right, thank you. Um, for Monica, one of the questions was what would, I think everyone felt inspired with kind of solid call to actions that we can do in our community and then also that anthropologists can do and taking down the walls of the classroom. What would do you think will be the most important message that anthropologists should be giving to either the public health workers or offices or who they're working with on the local level? What's an important message for anthropologists to send out? Well, um, oh, actually, if, well, there's a lot of messages, so this is an important message, but if you work with a community and have both language and cultural uh, competence in a local community that sits at the margins um, or is marginalized from, from the community life and 
health officials are going to have a harder time to earn their trust. Um, bring your expertise to your local health department um, and, and let them know that you have both language uh, and uh, cultural insights that can help. Uh, and, and particularly if you already have some relationship with uh, that community. So I'd highly recommend that you insert yourself, offer your, offer your skills there. All right, great, thank you. Um, Jen, another question, or for any of our speakers too, thinking of seasonality, I know a lot of people are wondering, and I know you mentioned in your slides, we don't really know what's gonna happen with warmer weather. There were some questions in the chat about, are we able to gain any knowledge or thoughts to answer this on the Southern Hemisphere or what's happening in Australia, kind of thinking of warmer weather? You know, I think it's really hard to tell because of so many differences in surveillance right now. So I, I don't see an easy way to do this with current surveillance numbers, uh, just current case data. Um, I do know that when we were first talking about this possibility of seasonality, um, Singapore stood out as a particularly uncomfortable example because it was a much warmer, humid climate and they were seeing a rapid expansion in cases despite those conditions. Um, they've since brought their case numbers down, but through, through, um, you know, through aggressive public health measures, did it, was it also aided by continuing warmer, you know, the um, change in climate? I, I can't really say. Um, coronaviruses, the ones that circulate all the time, do have a seasonality. So I think there's some hope that this may too. Um, but we also don't know if the seasonality is purely a function of, um, weather and you know and its effect you know on the virus but also um people's behavior changes in in the summer and we're less less inclined to sit around and cough on each other um so if we if we artificially change that because we are you know all homebound um it's it's hard for me to imagine what's going to happen And there was um, another, a few other questions if I kind of squished them together on demographics and risk. So we know we've heard a lot about the elderly. There's some questions if we can pull any other data of other, other demographics that are susceptible. Do we know any differences across um, sex, across ethnicity, across racial groups? Um, there had been a question about whether what men seem to be more frequently reported among the cases. And I think that that's largely been resolved to not being necessarily a function of the disease. And if there were an overweighting of men, it could have been more linked to social networks than and who was exposing whom. Um, but uh, so there was one kind of question about that, but the data haven't really continued that where uh, we still see lots of women getting it. Um, other demographics, no. And, and what we know now is that, you know, there's, there's these underlying health conditions and we know that there's advanced age, but unfortunately those two things tend to go together. So it's hard to delink them for age. We haven't done the studies yet. All right, thank you. Uh, Kristen, could I jump yes. in here? Um, just like we're trying to monitor for uh, the impacts of physical disease, we also need to be monitoring for the mental health impacts. I was talking to a psychologist uh, a day or two ago, she is worried about uh, increases in rates of domestic abuse as families are on top of each other during a period of intense social and economic distress. So I, I think we need to have the, the surveillance systems in place also for mental health impacts and to know their differential um, manifestations. Thank you. So we are running out of time and I just wanna acknowledge, I see a few comments in the chat. I realize that we have not been able to get to every single issue that we would like to discuss. Also that this is happening on a global scale. A lot of the presentation was focused on the America side. We don't wanna exclude the rest of the globe. What I'm hoping we can do as a discussion is to continue the discussion going forward and continue this being an ongoing discussion and collaboration. So we have the community's platform on the AAA site. 
it would be great if we can continue and expand and have a more holistic discussion of all different types of angles and topics and places in the world and recognizing how differently this is impacting people globally. So please, we will try to take all of the presentations, all of the questions that were in there that have not been answered, we will try to post those in there, but I encourage everybody to be active in there. I also want, before we have to close out, I want to mention that this is a series of webinars being put on by the AAAs, and so there is actually a responsive teaching and learning environment one, and the first part of that happened yesterday. The recording will be accessible on AAAs. Part two is actually happening next Tuesday on March 24th. The link is in here. All of these webinars um, will be recorded and available if you go to the American Anthropology website and then just go to webinars. And I also encourage you please if, to fill out our expertise database. It's a Google uh, survey form. It only takes a few minutes to fill it out and that way we can actively gather people and experts to respond. I also don't uh, wanna finish without saying thank you. So a special thank you to each of our speakers. To Jen, to Sam, and to Monica, thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your expertise. And I must also thank the American Anthropological Association, particularly Ed, Jeff, Scott, and Gabrielle. They have been the ones behind the scene holding all the logistics and putting it all together to, for us. So we truly appreciate all the help here. And, as, and, and Society for Medical Anthropology for their support. Yes. So thank you everyone. Um, hopefully this is only the beginning of our discussion and we can continue um, having a discussion and connections and collaboration on our platform in the communities. And it's Dion again. I just posted the link to the survey. Um, everybody's saying thank you, so you, which we appreciate. Thank you. But uh, scroll back, you'll see where I posted it. Um, at uh, 2.30, I posted it. All right, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to continue working together uh, through our way through this. Thank you. Thanks so much, all. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. No.